Hello, I'm Bart van Aardek. I'm Chief Economist at the Conference Board and welcome to this episode in our CEO forum, Building a More Civil and Just Society. Following the confluence of the COVID-19 crisis, the brutal death of George Floyd and the subsequent eruption of discontent in America specifically, but also more broadly around the world, we have become very aware that the burden of these events falls quite differently on people's shoulders. It really brought long-standing concerns about inequality, lack of resilience, and large differences in opportunity between people and groups and communities to the foreground. Today's program in the CEO Forum is the first episode on economic opportunities, and will be focused on some of the important work done at MasterCard on issues of economic opportunity and inclusiveness, and especially through the MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth. And for this, I'm honored to be joined by Mike Froman, who serves as Vice Chairman and President of Strategic Growth for MasterCard, and he also oversees the Center for Inclusive Growth. And in addition to his track record in the financial and banking community, Mark served as the U.S. Trade Representative in President Obama's administration from 2013 to 2017. And before that, he was an assistant to the President and Deputy National Security Advisor for International Economic Affairs. Mike, thank you for joining us for this series. Thanks for having me. If you don't mind, I want to start with a personal question. When I was preparing for this conversation, I came across a notion in one of your speeches on the importance of the so-called decency quotient. So in addition to the intelligence quotient and the emotional quotient, the decency quotient is about how we treat people, uh, how we treat our employees, how we treat our customers, our business partners, the community in which we work. So I wonder if you can reflect on that notion of a decency quotient in the light of the, the recent events, the, the, the pandemic, the prominence of racial injustice and so on. Sure. Well, actually, uh, we started talking about the decency quotient a couple of years ago, and our CEO, Ajay Banga, sort of introduced the concept. And the notion then was, as you said, that everybody's been focused on IQ and EQ. And we were looking for a way of how to describe how we view our company internally, but also externally in terms of the social impact that it, is, that it intends to have. And the notion of the decency quotient is really in, in the broadest sense of the word, how we treat our employees, how we treat our, our suppliers, our customers, our communities, the communities in which we operate and the broader, and the broader world. And internally, it is intended to include notions of diversity and inclusion, but it's broader than that. It's a notion that we want to work and live in a community where fundamentally we treat each other well. We treat each other with decency. We, we talk about putting our hand on each other's back, not in each other's face, helping each other succeed and get to the top, not by standing and on each other's, uh, uh, not by crushing others, but by really helping each other lift each other up. And that goes to everything from how we manage internally, as I said, to how we think about our role in society and our relationship with other stakeholders as well. Can you give a concrete example of something that you have done in the last uh, couple of months, given the pandemic and, and, and all, the, all the aftermath of the racial injustice things um, on, on you know, how you've tried to handle this, for example, within the company? Sure. So uh, internally, uh, clearly, the, the issues around racial equity in the United States have been incredibly uh, important and painful over the last uh, several months. You know, these are issues that have been around for decades, for centuries, actually. And uh, the way they've come to the fore has really helped us as a company build on work that we've been doing over the last several years on inclusion, on diversity, um, on inclusive growth. But focus internally, for example, on people issues, mm -hmm. um, very much focus on diversity and inclusion. How are we doing on recruiting uh, a diverse workforce, on promoting them, on developing careers, on ensuring that the workplace is a place that fosters decency and, and respect? How are we doing on pay equity, which is obviously very important? Um, and then externally, how do we engage with markets and with uh, society as a whole. And by markets, I mean, what do we do with our products and services to address racial equity issues? Right. Uh, one, ensuring that we're not having internal bias be built into them in any way, but also what can we do, for example, when it comes to the financially vulnerable to ensure that we're addressing, uh, addressing their concerns. 
So let's take a little bit. Yeah, let's take a little bit into that because that's I really wanted to to talk a little bit with the journey that you've been making with with the institute on this. And and you know you started and you already mentioned that at the time with financial inclusion, which obviously is a is a, a great topic for a company like Mastercard to work on. So. Um, you know, how has this notion of inclusive growth, of involving marginalized communities and individuals, how has it sort of grown upon you and your colleagues as something that wasn't just about others, but was essentially about yourselves as a company, as a think tank? So, so can you explain a little bit on sort of how you internalize that story of inclusive growth and financial inclusion in particular, and where it's, where it's bringing you today? Sure. Well, first of all, this is, is something we've been involved in for the better part of a decade. And it was a recognition that as a global company, we thrive when economies thrive and that uh, the only really truly sustainable form of growth is inclusive growth. And so seven years ago, uh, we created the Center for Inclusive Growth, which is, was our center for thought leadership and philanthropy and programs to help promote the notion of inclusive growth. We created a network of uh, major researchers from around the world who helped contribute to the field in this, uh, in this area in their, in their own ways. Um, and then when uh, 2017 came around and um, the, the tax cut in the United States and elsewhere, we decided let's commit another $500 million to inclusive growth. We created the MasterCard Impact Fund uh, to help uh, promote programs, help support programs that, uh, that promote inclusive growth. And it was part of a broader effort that we've been on for a while. So five years ago, we committed to bring half a billion individuals into the financial system. These were unbanked individuals who had no relationship to the financial system. We, we treated it like any other metric in the organization with regional goals, country goals, people knew what they had to do to get it done. And we succeeded in reaching that goal actually about nine months ahead of time. In, in the midst of COVID, and uh, we talked, we, we realized now more than ever, we need to double down on that commitment. So we raised the goal to a billion by 2025. And we said, we're also going to bring in 50 million micro and small merchants into the digital economy and focus on reaching 25 million women-owned and women-run businesses. And as you said, this is about, it goes very much to the heart of what we call doing well by, by doing good. It's very much, it's not just a good thing to do in its own right. It's very much in our interest to help expand the community of people who have a relationship to the financial system and the digital economy. If we can help them achieve their financial security, put them on a path towards greater prosperity, that's good for them. It's the right thing to do. And it's good for us as a company as well. So, so, so let me let me dive a little bit more deeply into that. I, I wanted to sort of take a recent quote from you, which I thought was a really good quote. Uh, and that quote was as follows, quote, one thing that is sometimes underestimated is how expensive it is to be poor and the kinds of engagement and transactions that people are financially vulnerable have to rely on to, to get access to their money. So, you know, this is at the heart of the matter. For example, if you think about today, you know, with people probably having to ramp up their debt because, you know, their income balance sheets look very weak. But, you know, if you increase your debt, your debt payments are also going to increase. So, so this is a, a critical issue that as a, as a credit card company, you're right in the middle of, right? How do you get people out of that trap of debt uh, and present that or prevent them from actually falling back into it? So, so can you give me some one or two great Exam, real-time examples of how you're trying to deal with those challenges that people face when they're beginning to engage with the financial community. Sure. Well, we started looking at this and, and looking at how people have to rely on either payday lenders or expensive check cashers or um, expensive ways of sending money to their family or friends domestically or internationally. And there's some estimates that it can cost a family $40,000 over the course of sure. their, their lifetime uh, simply to get access to their own money and conduct these very basic transactions. So we're looking at what can we do as a company with our existing tools or existing products and services to make it easier to do those things. Uh, for example, you know, why is it that we get paid every two weeks, uh, that we wait for a paycheck? you know, in the old ways of thinking about it mm -hmm. to come in the mail. Well, nobody's getting paychecks anymore. Very few people are, uh, uh, but we're still thinking about it as a two week cycle. 
when if you're a gig worker and you're working for a ride-sharing company, uh, uh, you may want access to those wages uh, uh, every week or every other day. Um, yeah, you may need access to those uh, wages. And if we can find an easy and cost-effective way for people to get access to those wages, which is what we're doing, then they don't have to go to a, a payday lender uh, necessarily and pay an expensive interest rate, as you said, to get access to their own money. I think the other part of this is uh, people rely on expensive sources of credit because they can't get credit elsewhere. Yeah. And as we further develop our data analytics, uh, can we help provide mechanisms for people to, to strengthen their credit ratings, to create credit ratings, so that they can get access to more economical forms of credit and don't run up the high interest rate kind of credit that you were referring to before. It seems to be so much about sort of building a trust relationship between those communities and, and the financial institution they're working with, right? Because it quite often feels like, okay, they're just, you know, uh, tested on their credit rating. Uh, whereas in the, in the end, it's, it has to be a long-term relationship to get, to get these groups from the, the marginalized situation into a, into a situation where they can have a sustainable financial development. So, so how do you build this kind of trust relationship going beyond, uh, you know, getting an email or a, a call that you're in trouble versus one where, you know, where the institution really is your partner in trying to sort of get you out of that trap into a sustainable growth path? Well, I think you need to earn it. Um, and as a, as a company, um, one reason we've been involved in financial inclusion is because it's, it's genuine and authentic to who we are. And so as we can reach out to communities and say, look, we understand how important it is to be part of the networks, the physical networks, the virtual networks, the, the social networks that are key to being productive, that are key to putting yourself on a path to prosperity, and we can help you because we are part of those networks. We're a network company. So if we can connect you with the tools that you need to succeed, then um, we can help uh, we can help build uh, we can help build that that trust and just again for for example in the context of of covid clearly small businesses have been particularly adversely affected and so uh, that's an important um, group of customers uh, to us an important seg segment that we focus on and so we committed 250 million dollars of products services and financial support to help small businesses get through the crisis to help move them, for example, from brick and mortar businesses to online businesses. And as they do more online uh, transactions, more online commerce to make sure that we're providing them with cybersecurity protection, anti-fraud protection. So helping them make that transition and helping them succeed in that transition. Um, and I think that helps us build further trust with those small businesses. Yeah. So, so another big barrier here is uh, the digital environment. So you know, and under COVID-19, everything has become even more digital. I, I'm actually amazed how some financial transactions would have been unthinkable to do digital in the past, and suddenly this is all possible. But this puts even more of a burden on some of the marginalized communities who basically don't have access to broadband, who may at best have a cell phone that is far from perfect and doesn't have all the features, uh, and so on and so forth. So the digital divide is, is a real stumbling block for those communities to really get fully engaged. So how, how are you thinking about this issue and, and what are you doing to help to happen to help to, to sort of close that digital so gap and what kind of role can a private sector partnership play here? Sure. Well, you're absolutely right. And, and, and uh, again, COVID and has really underscored just how important it is to be connected uh, because so much has moved uh, in, into the digital sphere. Um, you know, what we've tried to do is really use our, our tools and our products and services to help people get into the digital economy. We're not a broadband company. We're, not going to build cell towers and, and things of that sort. But what we can do is help them use whatever connectivity they have to do more of their transactions safely and securely. So whether it's a prepaid card that we have helped governments issue all over the world as they do social disbursements or disbursements to small businesses. We've got literally scores of governments, hundreds of projects all over the world underway right now of helping governments provide subsidies or social disbursement payments to individuals uh, 
uh, and small businesses. And even in areas where there's no connectivity, we've been experimenting, for example, in parts of Africa with offline digital transactions so that you can go to your, your local um, store at the end of, of the road um, and have a digital account. And that that store owner, once a week, goes into the nearby village where there might be connectivity and uploads and is able to keep accounts uh, current because you know, they can do things offline as well as online. Um, and so we've been experimenting with our business models and with our technology to see what can we do in environments where there's full connectivity and making sure people have full suite of, of, of services available to them. What can we do where there's spotty or no connectivity and still help people benefit from being part of the digital economy? Yeah, and quite often, I think it's also a lot about simplifying the processes, right? And, you know, some, you know, if you go digital, the burden of reporting can become so more troublesome and the amount of information that is required for you to get a loan or anything like that. So simplifying procedures and processes is probably an important part of this as well, right? You know, on that issue, just as an example, again, I'll, I'll start with Africa, but we're doing this elsewhere. Um, we started digitizing the relationship between a, a very small a micro merchant their consumer products supplier like Unilever and a local bank. And so these were transactions that were completely done in cash before. They were invisible to the financial system uh, when uh, a local micro merchant would buy supplies from, uh, from, from Unilever. Now we digitize that, the local bank can see that and can begin to offer credit to the micro merchant because for the first time they can see the flow of funds back and forth. That allows the micro merchant to buy more from Unilever, Unilever's happy, to sell more to their customers. Their customers are happy and the micro merchants happy and the local bank is getting repaid because they can see the flow of funds and have reasonable assurance of repayment. So it's, it's how do you use digitization in that way to help bring people into the system, give them access to credit, allow them to expand their business, hire more people and grow their economy. Great. So the third issue I want to bring up, in addition to financial inclusion and digital divide, we talked about is cities. Uh, you, you've done a lot of work at MasterCard on cities, and this is quite relevant for the topic that we're talking about. I mean, cities are the places which are the sources of wealth, but at the same time, the pockets of, of poverty, if you like. And, and we know that minority groups like African-Americans can be hugely disadvantaged in those urban settings in terms of access to housing or education or other basic needs. And then, you know, COVID-19 probably makes it even harder on cities in terms of unemployment and health risks. But at the same time, you know, cities are very resilient places and providing people with opportunities to actually get out of the underprivileged situation they're in and escape poverty. So how can cities, what are you, what is your thinking about cities to make them an instrument to be more inclusive uh, in terms of, of these communities? Well, as you said, there's been a strong trend towards urbanization um, and while COVID may slow that down a little bit, it's likely to ultimately continue. And the key is, how do you urbanize in an inclusive fashion? So we've created a network of cities called City Possible, and it's cities from all over the world, and, and mayors from cities all over the world, they all share similar challenges, maybe slightly different in one place or another, but they're all dealing with issues around mobility, around congestion, around housing, poverty, how to deliver social services, in an effective manner and the like. And we brought them together and, and partnering with Harvard, given an opportunity for them to share views, work together on problems, and, and for us to help them, uh, help them work through those problems uh, along, the, along the way. So for example, we've provided our, some of our data insights um, to cities to really understand what's going on neighborhood by neighborhood. Um, we looked at, for example, the Claiborne Corridor in New Orleans, a historically African-American neighborhood that really went through a very difficult period as a highway was built right through the middle of the neighborhood. And now it's beginning to see a renaissance. And with, through our data, we can see, well, what's the spending power of people who live in that neighborhood? What's going on with the development of small businesses? And help the local leaders understand and apply policies that can help promote inclusive growth in that neighborhood. We've worked with cities, particularly in the midst of COVID, to both uh, collect donations from their community and disperse um, social funds to people in need. In, in Los Angeles, uh, working with Mayor Garcetti and Accelerator for America, we created a donations to dis disbursement 
platform where people give money to the mayor's fund and the mayor's fund in turn gives them out to people who are particularly adversely affected by COVID on a prepaid card so they can use them safely and, and securely um, around, around town for, for particular purposes. And we're now doing that in, in, in dozens of, of other places uh, as well. So we've tried to co-create with cities, what are their challenges, um, partner with them, and bring either our resources or the resources of others to the table to help them address the needs that, uh, that they have. Yeah, and I do believe that cities are a place where that kind yeah. of social experimentation, policy experimentation, is really happening in a very exciting way. Yeah, it, it, it strikes me that the granularity of data, right? You're looking at particular neighborhoods and how you can use real-time data in terms of you know, people's behaviors and movements and financial transactions that they're making. That is a very informative source for city leaders who quite often don't have that access to data to really understand where the pain points are, where the real-time developments are, where they need to intervene quickly before things get worse. So it seems to me that's, that you know, making it more actionable is a very important part of this. Yes, that's part of that. We developed at, at the census tract level, first of all, in data, we're very, very focused on our data responsibility principles. We, we, uh, we don't, we call it, when you use your card, we don't know your name. We don't know what it is you buy. Everything is aggregated, anonymized. Uh, we protect privacy. But within, with, with that as a foundation, we can then draw analytic uh, conclusions from, uh, from that data. And we've driven, uh, drilled down to the census level in the United States to show not just economic activity, but what we call the inclusive growth scorecard. So what's going on with the economy and spending, but also what's going on with affordable housing? Uh, what's going on with small business creation? And that's proven to be very uh, important right now, particularly in the context of the domestic issues in the United States around, okay, how do we make sure that as we are rebuilding growth coming out of COVID, that we're not um, dispersing communities, that we're not excluding communities? Uh, how do we make sure that it's really an inclusive form of, of growth and uh, not just look at the, at the top line numbers? Yeah. Yeah, very interesting. So we need to wrap up a lot of things to talk about, but I, I, I do want to ask you a, a tricky question. I mean, a lot of this discussion around racial injustice, right? You feel like, okay, here we are again. Um, you know, a lot has changed, uh, but what is really changing here despite all the good intent? Now, you know, on paper, we obviously have made dramatic strides towards, you know, creating greater justice and fairness and uh, trying to sort of improve the system, giving people opportunity, but the reality is quite harsh, uh, as we see and hear every day. So I want to ask you this closing question, sort of what is sort of the one single thing that you want to see happen to make sure that 15 years from now, you know, fairness and opportunity uh, for all minority groups will really have changed for the better compared to the the slow pace that we have made 15 years ago, I mean, over the past 15 years. So, so, you know, there's so many things that need to be done, but what's the single thing that really is kind of your North Star here? You know, I'd say that um, the, the one single thing that I hope would change, and I'm optimistic that it is changing, is the sense that the companies have that this is a responsibility of theirs as well. Um, government is absolutely critical, philanthropy is critical, uh, non-profit organizations play, a, a, and civic organizations play an absolutely critical role, but there's a role for companies to play. And I think we're seeing that right now. And, and the reason I'm optimistic is, you think back over the last couple of years from, from Larry Fink's letters uh, over the last couple of years to CEOs about focusing not just on short-term economic results, but social impact, to the business roundtable statement of a year ago, I think companies are understanding that they operate in a social environment and need to focus on their social impact as part of achieving long-term shareholder value. That the only way to achieve long-term shareholder value is to focus on these broader sets of issues as well, whether it's the environment or in, in the US, racial equity issues. And I think what these issues have been around for a long time, we've seen the ebbs and flows of attention paid to them. I think what's different this time is that companies are, are realizing that they have a critical role themselves, both in how they treat their employees and their, and their suppliers and their customers, 
and also how they uh, treat the, the communities in which they operate and what impact they have into, in the communities in which they operate. Yeah, I think it's, it's again, it's this confluence of events, COVID-19, uh, you know, George Floyd's death and the aftermath of it. It's kind of bringing it all together and think, you know, we need to do something now because otherwise, you know, we're with the back against the wall and, and there's really no good way out of this. So I, I think you're right that this, this momentum that we have, it's important that, uh, that, that we keep that momentum going. And I, I want to thank you for this because I, I think, you know, you gave us a great insight in the work that, that you're doing, but also some really good uh, examples of uh, how we actually can keep that momentum going. And I wish you a lot of uh, uh, good success and luck with the center. And we hope, look forward to hearing much more about it. Thanks, Mike, for, for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you all for joining us for this episode uh, in our series, our CEO forum, Building a More Civil and Just Society. Uh, if you want to access other videos that we've done, other relevant content the conference board is producing on this topic, then please go to our website, conference-board.org, and you'll find the resource button right there. Thank you for joining us. My name is Bart van Arnik at the conference board. <laughs>